Hey gang, Sean from The Good Dog, and we have got phase one with Mr. Ernie here uh, of sit, e-collar sit. So we've already done prong collar phase one with sit, prong collar phase two with sit, I think, right? <laughs> My memory's a little bit challenging. Um, so now we're going to, because he's already been conditioned with prong collar pressure for what sit means. So he's heard the word, moved into the position, release pressure. Okay, gotten the re gotten the gotten the, the verbal marker. So sit, but hits the ground. Good. Leash pressure goes away over and over and over again. He knows exactly what it means. Now we overlay e-collar on top of that. And then we start to build an off-leash sit. So the whole goal is that we train all these behaviors so the dog understands what they all mean. Then we overlay the e-collar and then we slowly start to move away from having to use leashes, long lines, and things like that. And we get to the point, excuse me, where the dog is then e-collar fluent and able to, um, what's the word? operate, a able to, um, perform? yes, able to perform all of the activities off leash. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so that's really what the goal is. So, but it starts all on leash. And for us, like I said, you can start with food lowering and you can go to prong and then you can go to e-collar. And, and that way you make sure that the dog understands all of it. We don't do food luring except with puppies. We do prong, we make sure the dog understands all the commands. Then we overlay e-collar on top of it and it works like a charm. So it's really not that complicated. And as long as you're being fair, tuned in with the dog and using levels that are appropriate fair for the dog, and an e-collar that is a high quality e-collar, you guys should be in a good space where you can get great stuff. So let's see what we get. I'm gonna start at four with him. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna say the word, I'm gonna press the button at the same time, I'm gonna add the teeniest bit of leash pressure, and if I don't feel any give with it, then I'm gonna keep pressing and holding, and I'm gonna roll up just the slightest bit until he gives to that pressure. So I don't, I could easily make him sit with the prong and that's what a lot of you folks will do. A lot of you folks will ask for the SIT and then if the dog doesn't give it, you'll stay at four or five or six or seven or whatever your level is here holding and then you'll make it happen with the prong. That's not the goal. The goal is that the leash and prong is just there to whisper to the dog, hey, this, this thing, this is what you need to do. So you want basically, if you can think about it, you want 90% of the pressure, and that doesn't mean explosive pressure, but you know, relative to the prong pressure, you want 90% of the pressure roughly coming from here, 10% coming from the leash and prong, which means that's a whisper. This is much more talking to him than that because we, our goal is to get the dog off the leash to where they're listening to this. So that said, let's see what we get now that I've yacked all about that. I'm going to do all of it. And it's gonna look like this. Sit, dialing up, good. So that went to five, from four to five, right? So what you saw was, or what you heard and saw was the word, the button hold and press, tiny bit of pressure with the leash. He didn't quite sit. So I repeated the command, I think if I remember right, and I kept holding, I had to hold for 10 seconds, and then I rolled up just a little bit to five, but hit the ground, cool. Remember guys, I know the dog knows it on leash and prong. I know they've been all the way to the second phase of corrections on leash and prong. This is a new sensation, it's a new, it's a new tool, it feels different, it's, it's a new experience for the dog. So just because the dog's done well with leash and prong, don't automatically assume that they have to do or should perform at the same level, at the same speed as they have with the prong. It's a new thing. So we're, we're basically teaching a new thing over the old thing. It will move faster than it would without it, but it still needs to move in a nice organic way 
fashion pace. Okay, so ready to play? Let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Remember, anytime you're trying to have your dog sit, you're going to walk up. You're going to pause momentarily before you ask for it. Don't ask for it. I'm going to do it again. Don't ask for the SIT. Come on, bud. Let's go, go, go. Don't ask for the SIT while you're still moving because it's confusing for the dog, right? Don't ask for it. So make sure you come to a pause. Sit. Good. That's a boy. That's a boy. So whether you can see it all or not, I will give you an instant replay. And that was, I'm at five. I stayed there because four didn't really seem motivational. And if you've listened to what I said earlier about um, perception level versus motivational level, I'm looking for the level he cares about enough to actually execute the behavior. So I'm starting at five because four seemed kind of like, eh. So what I did, I walked up, paused momentarily, said S-I-T, pressed the button as soon as I said the word, held, and then I just let, I let the leash, if you can pan down so you can see it, I let the leash stay just like this, which was relaxed, zero pressure, because I wanted to see what would happen without any upward guidance. Would he give me the sit without anything like this, even a hint of it, right? Even without a whisper, would he give me that? Because he should, because he's had a lot of reps. So if he can't, if he's stuck, if he's one of those dogs that's more challenged by it, then I'm here to help. I'm here to use the leash and prong to help put him in that position. The goal isn't to be like, dude, you know this, and I'm going to turn this up and tell you know it. That's not the goal. The goal is, I want to make sure you feel this, that you care enough about it to try and turn it off. But if you have any problems with turning it off, I'm here to help you by giving a little bit of upward pressure with the leash and prong to where you can actually execute the sit and then you get clarity. So if you're confused, I'm here to help. If you're being stubborn, I'm also here to help, but I'll help in a different way. I might go a little bit higher. Right? I might offer less help with this. The dog's personality should tell you so much about how you approach this approach. So super stubborn dog, hmm. super, let me, let, me, let me say it this way. Super stubborn, clear-headed, sharp as attack dog. And I don't mean attack, sharp as a tack dog. If you're doing this exercise with them, and you say, and you've done all the preliminary work, you say, sit, and you press and hold, and the dog's like, then if they've shown me that, in, in they, if they've shown me in prior behavior that they're stubborn and willful and that they're really not into it, then I will say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to continue to hold, I'm gonna start rolling up, and I'm not going to give you much help here because you know, because I know your personality, you know what I'm looking for, but you're deciding. You're making a decision not to work with me, so then I'm going to have to hold you accountable. And that's where things get into this whole nuanced space of like, how do you ensure that you best serve the dog? Because I certainly don't serve a willful, stubborn, bratty dog to the highest level if I'm holding his hand constantly and like, oh, he doesn't understand. Let me help him back into a sit. At some point, you have to figure out what dog do you have and then make sure your program is best serving them because if they're bratty, you need to work through that to where they're not bratty, to where they're giving you the good stuff. If they're confused or worried, then you need to help them work through that stuff, which means probably lower levels, more repetitions, more help with the leash until they get it. Oh, I got it. Okay, that's what this is, right? I, I can't emphasize that enough that you have to understand the dog that you have. And, and I gave you like two black and white examples, confused, nervous, worry dog, willful, stubborn, bratty dog. And then there's a million variations in between. So you have to find out where your dog sits within that spectrum. Okay, let's go, bud. Come on, come on, come on. And this guy's not really bratty. I mean, he's he's pretty darn good. He'll have his little moments here and there like, like anybody can. 
But for the most part, he's a pretty easy guy. So I pretty much give him the benefit of the doubt with this stuff. Here we go. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, he's ready. He said he's ready. Here we go. Let's go. Walk up. Pause. Sit. Good. Very nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's go. Now what I want to do differently this time, I didn't really add pressure, but there was a teeny tiny, just a smidge of this. And I want to get rid of this. I want to make sure my arm is just relaxed like this. So I just gave a little smidge of pressure more than I wanted to because I really want him to do it on his own and make sure that he's doing it on his own. So if you see me in this video with this arm moving like this, make sure you comment, make sure you send me a nasty email and go like, I saw your arm move. Like you didn't hold it. You didn't hold it neutral. That's the goal. Let's see what we can do. You ready, bud? Here we go. Let's go. Arm neutral. Arm neutral. Sit. Good. So I didn't move my arm. He moved out a little, in, a little in front of me, which put pressure on the leash, which if you really want to be like hard on me, you could argue and say, well, you put some pressure on the leash. I could have moved forward and then taken some of that pressure off, but he might have moved forward too. And if you listen very carefully, you would have noticed that my finger came off the button at some point. I don't know if you heard a clickety click. I was on the button at five and then at some point my finger just slipped off and it went and it came off, but he executed this very nicely. Um, let me see if I can do it really nicely and then we'll wrap this up. Um, well, let me say, let me, let me see. Let me do one more of these and let me do some with some, uh, some basic proofing around it and then we'll go from there. Ready? Let's go. Come on, buddy boy. Okay, ready? Don't make me look bad. Don't go out in front of me. Here we go. Sit. Dialing up. Sit. Sit. Good. There you go. So that went up to six. I was at, I think, five before. So that's how slow I was rolling. So when you heard me say dialing up, so once again, guys, let me, let me remind y'all, this is the beginning, first phase. And don't get caught. Hey, he knew this on prong collar. He's being a real, you know, persnickety fellow that's not listening. No, it's a new tool. It's a new thing. So do not apply what you had in prong collar work to this work directly. We did those phases, now we do these phases. You gotta trust me with this. This is how we work through, through the process. So this is phase one. So I'm not going to like goose this up and or hit him with a big correction or anything like that, or even a mild correction really for, for not putting his butt on the ground. So what you saw was I said sit and he went like halfway. Got stuck kind of halfway. Who knows why? You'd have to ask him. And what did I do? What did I do? I, if, you're, if you listen carefully, you heard me say dialing up. And that means I was holding at five. His butt was like this. And I just said dialing up, repeated the command, sit, pretty sure. And I was rolling and I was rolling slow. He's a sensitive guy. He doesn't need me to be whoom. And I ended up at six. And that was enough for him to plant his butt on the ground. As soon as his butt hit the ground, off goes the pressure on the e-collar. Good. Give him a little bit of uh, some pets. Make sure the, the leash is relaxed. And that's the beginning of phase one with sit. So I'll walk around him. If he jumps out of it, we're going to say N-O. And then press and hold the button until he's back in it. <laughs> Hi, bud. What? So he's way better with these SITs than he was when we started with prong collar. It's nice to see. 
because when we first started with prong collar, anytime I walked around him, he was out of that position. He was boogieing around, doing his own thing. So this is super cool to see. Already better, already better. All right. So this is what you wanna do as far as beginning the proofing process, right? And if your dog's super rock and roll, you can drop the leash. You can walk around. Problem is if you drop the leash, then that means that it's gonna take a moment for you to get to the leash to be able to control him and put him back into position. Eventually the, eventually the leash will come off, but right now I can tell he's pretty sturdy right there. So I can drop the leash. That's something we wanna to get to eventually, but don't feel rushed. It's just something to shoot for. One last one, then we'll wrap it up. Ready, bud? Let's go. Come on, come on, come on. I'm gonna dial back down to five. Come on, buddy. Here we go. Okay, last one. Here we go, buddy boy. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Sit. Good. <laughs> That's great. And I still noticed I didn't put pressure up, but I still lifted my arm just a teeny bit. I'm so mad at myself. It's just a habit, but it's a good thing to see that like habits are very easy to get into, even if you're being conscious of them. Now, I didn't apply enough pressure to actually make him sit, but I just noticed just because I'm being anal about it, I noticed that I went like that. So don't be hard on yourself if you make mistakes. If you find yourself doing things repeatedly that you're like, geez, I know I shouldn't be doing that. It's going to happen to any of us, right? Dog trainer or dog owner, you're going to hit the wrong button. You're going to be at the wrong level. You're going to use the wrong command. You're going to use too much leash pressure, not enough leash pressure, too much e-collar pressure, not enough e-collar pressure. You're gonna keep moving when you give the command, when you should have stopped. You're, you're gonna do a multitude of things wrong that you don't wanna do. And you have to cut yourself some slack. The dog will cut you some slack. All you need to shoot for is, if you shoot for 80%, like consistent, successful, looking pretty good, 80, man, hit 90, like you're rocking. But if you hit 80, man, you're gonna be great. People get so caught up with this training thing of like any mistake is going to completely undermine the dog, completely ruin the training, completely like confuse the dog. No, whatever you do most of the time consistently, and even if there's some inconsistencies in that consistency, whatever you do most of the time, which is why I'm saying if 80% of the time you do things right, that's what's going to become your norm. Your dog's going to go, uh, that's probably not what you meant. You probably meant this, probably meant this, probably meant this, because your dog is going to figure out what you're doing most of the time. Now, that's not an invitation to be careless or reckless or not be focused or not try your hardest, but what it is, is hopefully a little bit of a, a little bit of a reminder a little bit of a pat on the back, like, hey, give yourself a break. This is something challenging. This is something new. This is something that's like, you know, patting your head and rubbing your stomach and, and there's a lot of pieces involved. So give yourself time, understand you're gonna make mistakes. And if you just take your time and are patient and you do 80%, your dog's gonna do great. And if you make those mistakes that you're going to make, please don't beat yourself up about it. It's just gonna happen. Happens to dog trainers all the time. What's the difference? We just work through it. That's the only difference. Dog trainers just work through it. Dog owners flip out about it and get super upset. And then they're like, oh my God, my dog's you know never going to recover. Dog trainers like, oh, that was a little mistake. And then they just keep rolling. The dog forgot about it 10 minutes ago. That's what I'd like you to think about. Just focus on doing the best you can. Cut yourself some slack and move slow as you need to move for your dog and for yourself. Like, as much as I say, don't keep the training wheels on too long. If you're going to make, if you're going to err, err on the side of training wheels too long and a slower arc towards progress. That's really my best advice I can give you with this entire training how-to series. If if you need to, keep the training wheels on longer. You're not gonna do any damage. The only way you'll do damage is if you never take the training wheels off. 
if they stay on for the next eight, nine, 10, 12 years of your dog's life, that's probably not gonna serve you. But if it takes three, four, six, eight, 10, 12 months to get to where you wanna go, fair enough. I would rather you move at a pace that works for you and your dog than try and like match some other dog trainer's pace or some other dog owner that's a rock star in your neighborhood and how they're doing it. Just work at the pace that works for you and your dog. Keep the training wheels on as long as you need to. Move organically, move slow, take care of you and your dog. You guys will be great, okay? We all make mistakes. I just did. Even though it was a minor one, it's still like super annoying. Anyways, uh, we'll see you guys with the next video coming up very soon with Mr. Sleepy Pants. Um, getting to sleep already. Right? I know. But, but if, if I can, you know, if I can, let me, let me say one last thing because I obviously haven't talked enough. Our program and how we do it is designed to create more relaxed, chilled out, and possibly even sleepy dogs. He's not gonna have any problem if I take him in the backyard right now and run around and throw a ball with him, being crazy and being off the hook and just being a nut job. That's not gonna be a problem. But what I'm doing, everything I'm doing, these repetitions, all of these exercises, if anybody is like, wow, that dog just doesn't look happy, what I'm doing is I'm slowing him down, I'm calming him down, I'm relaxing, I'm chilling him out. And it's actually a very nice byproduct to have a dog that is made sleepy. Like you've heard the thing, I've said it a million times, like pushing back against it. A tired dog is a good dog. Well, what if dog training itself helps create a relaxed, chilled out, tired dog but it's actually you creating it rather than just trying to run a marathon to wear them out and create it. Just something to think about. So when people are maybe like, oh, your dog looks sad in place, or your dog looks sad in a down, or that's typically what people project onto it, just say, no, nah, he's just relaxed. He's just calm. He's just chilled out. He's just being good. And that's what this entire program is about. Because as I always say, the one question I've never been asked is, how can I make my dog more excited? Or how can you make my dog more excited? No one's ever asked me that. So if we're getting dogs to be more relaxed, more chilled, more calmed out, more calm, <laughs> chilled out, I think that's a good thing. Anyways, we'll see you with the next video and I'll do less yakking that time. All right, thanks Aaron.